As already stated, we began a series of lessons on the Bible doctrines. And again, this is foundational stuff. And um, they are these Bible doctrines, they're to be known. They're to be loved. And they're to be faithfully observed. These are not things that you can just say, well, I don't want any part of that. No, they are, these are foundation material stuff. Last week we taught on the infallible word of God. And again tonight we're diving into the doctrine of faith. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Several weeks ago you might remember that I ventured into Hebrews 11 for some 10 verses or so. And we were exploring a little bit about faith. I believe I preached about opening the door of faith. Opening the doorway of faith. Tonight I really want to get into this chapter in its entirety where we find many examples of faith in action. You know, the scripture talks about faith without works is dead being alone. So you can say you've got faith, but you've got to put some action with that faith for it to be living, for it to be active, for it to work. Hallelujah. You can say, I, I just believe such and such is going to happen. Just saying you believe it, that's certainly an action, but belief is about more than saying I believe it. Belief is about knowing beyond the shadow of a doubt that God is in control and that God's going to do a work or is really is already doing a work. And so, again, I want to get into this, this passage in its entirety because it really speaks to this whole chapter of the Bible is on faith, belief, expectation. It gets into the promises of God and how those that were known as the champions of faith, those that overcome many, came many obstacles to rise above through the faith that they had in God, uh, they are referenced in this chapter. And you know, if we will just follow the pattern, if we'll just do what they did, we might just find that we're rising above some of the things that this old world brings our way. Anybody found that this old world brings some negatives your way? Well, if you live in this world very long, you're going to find a few of those negatives. And yet God is the great equalizer. I'm telling you, God can, God can minimize whatever this world brings our way. So Hebrews 11.1 1 begins like this. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, it's the evidence of things not seen. The expositor writes here, faith treats things hoped for as fact and places confidence today in what has been promised for the future. Faith is an absolute conviction based on the assurance of God's unchangeable and perfect character that his promises will be fulfilled. In other words, this isn't a maybe so. In other words, if you've got faith in the promises of God, they will be fulfilled. So again, faith is the substance of things hoped for or expected. Faith is the evidence of things that we can't see in the natural. Verse 2, for by it, for by faith, the elders obtained a good report. The elders' faith, their belief in the promises of God, guess what? Their belief actually pleased God. Their faith caused them to believe not only that God was, but also that he was a rewarder of those that diligently sought him. Verse 3, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. The point being, many today have faith only in what they can see. The problem being, God took something that was unseen 
and framed the worlds with that unseen stuff. God took what was invisible and made something highly visible. Think about this. There was nothing to see, but then God made all sorts of things in the heavens that could be seen from earth with only the natural eye. For instance, God made the Andromeda galaxy from the unseen. In our galaxy in the Milky Way, it's been estimated that we have between 100 and 400 billion stars just in our galaxy alone. But the Andromeda galaxy boasts somewhere around a trillion stars. On a clear night, you can see the Andromeda galaxy with eyes only in spite of it being two and a half million miles away from the Milky Way. And God again made all that we see today from something that was unseen. And you say, well, Brother Sarton, it takes faith to believe that. That's why we're talking about this foundation material called faith. Verse 4, then said, by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead, yet speaketh. Here we are thousands of years from these two boys in the Garden of Eden, and here we are talking about Abel and the sacrifice that he offered. Again, by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. The question is this, how did Abel know what to offer to God? How did Cain know what he should have offered to God and yet rebelled against God? How did he know? Well, God had to tell them. Well, you say, what do you mean God had to tell them? There was no written word that far back. And so God had to speak into their spirits, and he had to let them know, this is what I desire. Verse 5, by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him for before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Friends, anybody want to be a God pleaser? And I want to be a God pleaser. I want God, every time he looks at me, to, to have a smile on his face. I want God to draw pleasure from the way that I serve him. Again, Abel pleased God, and God accepted his sacrifice. Enoch pleased God, and God took him. He said, this world, no, he said, I want you more than this world needs you. So come on up here with me. And he never saw death. Well, hallelujah. In fact, verse 6 spells out how important faith really is when it said, but without faith it is impossible to please him, to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You know, I can believe in a God, but if I don't believe he will reward me when I seek him, then I'm not going to receive anything from him. But if I believe that a reward is coming, on, coming my way because I'm giving to him glory, I'm giving to him thanks, I'm giving to him adoration. If I'm focused on him, I'm telling you, God's focused on me. One writer said, not only does faith bring insight and confidence that are un otherwise unavailable, but the believer must also have this faith to even please God. True faith is not just a passive belief that God exists, although this is essential, but faith also actively seeks him and his will and looks to the future boldly, believing that God will reward his faithful people. You know why we're not surprised when God opens doors that were closed to us before? 
it's because of faith. You know why we're not surprised when God does miraculous things, does, does mighty things in the lives of people, and, and we, we, you say, well, we didn't see that coming, and yet deep down inside of us we knew that God was in charge and that God was still working, and so all of a sudden it happens, and, and we just say, well, thank you, God. Praise God. I'm so thankful for my brother. I'm so thankful for my sister. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Then in verse 7 we find, by faith, Noah being warned of God, of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. You say, oh, I just believe that's a fable. Let me tell you something. Just about every nation's history tells the story about this huge ship that took people on board, that took animals on board. I'm telling you, just about every single, I'm talking about every single, um, I'm talking about every single, I lost that word, every single nation that's ever been, they all talk about an ark that picked up people and picked up animals and saved them from a worldwide flood. So that all had to come from somewhere. Somebody say amen. Let's say, well, let me read it again. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not yet seen, moved with fear, prepared an ark, saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. You see, faith always brings an action. You say, well, I've got faith. Well, where's the action? Are you moving? Noah moved with fear. In other words, he moved with concern. And he got to building on something that was far beyond him. How in the world is somebody that, that perhaps has never built even a doghouse is building something that's big enough to take on, on its, on its, on its uh, circumference all of these animals and people? How in the world did that happen? It happened because he had faith. He trusted God. And what God told him to do, that's what he did. Amen. So he moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Let me tell you what, if you've got faith, then you've got a hold of some righteousness. That's important. So faith always brings an action. God spoke to Noah. He acted. He got busy building. And this is the way the anointed preaching of the word takes place. The preacher preaches under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Individuals are moved to action, and when these act, God responds to their acts of faith. How in the world is it that people who have, have never received, received anything from God, perhaps, all of a sudden in an apostolic service, the preacher gets to preaching and they're stirred beyond belief. They make their way to an altar, have never heard anything even about receiving the Holy Ghost. But before you know it, all of a sudden they break through into the presence of God and they're speaking in other tongues. And, and how is it they go into the waters of baptism and have their sins washed away? It's because somehow or another that preached word, that anointed preached word dug up their souls. And it drew them to a place where they were willing to submit to God. And God does miraculous things when we act on our faith. Amen. Well, amen. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should have to receive for an inheritance, guess what he did? He obeyed. And he went out not knowing whether he went. He didn't know where he was going. God just said, come. Separate yourself from this, this household of idolaters and come. And when he went out, he didn't know where in the world he was going. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Listen to this. For he looked for a city which had foundations whose builder and maker is God. Take note of this, church. Abraham didn't have a clue where in the world he was going. He didn't have a road map that would take him to the precise locale of this city whose builder and maker was God. He simply acted. 
he went. He moved because he believed. And as he looked, he just kept on going. Just kept on going. So really what happened was faith moved him to obey God. And ultimately, guess what? He found that city the day that he breathed his last and stepped into that place that the Lord had built for all of his children to come to when their lives on earth are over. Verse 11, through faith also Sarah received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age. I'm going to tell you, she was way past age. How did this happen? It's because she judged him, God, faithful, who had promised Therefore sprang there even of one in him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. In other words, they were seeking for what God said was theirs. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country that is an heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. So let's think about this. Abraham was 100 years old. 100 years old. Sarah was 90 when Isaac was born. We know Isaac's birth had been impossible with man alone. And yet God does the impossible time and time again. And yet Abraham's life was about far more than simply searching for a city whose builder and maker was God. It was also about this supernatural act that in time, I'm talking about a child being born to a man 100 and a woman 90. It was also about this supernatural act that would in time produce multitudes. Verse 13, then said by faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. See the parallel there? Of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. Now you say, I've got faith, Brother Sarton. Let me tell you something. Old Brother Abraham had some faith. Old brother Abraham truly had some faith. He said it like this. Uh, by faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith, Jacob, when he was a dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worship, leaning upon the top of his staff. Does anybody remember why he was leaning on the top of his staff? He had a wrestling match with God. Hip was thrown out of joint. The hip, the hip shrunk. And, and yet for the rest of his life, he had to walk on a cane. Point being, for Abraham, for his heirs, as the old song goes, this world was not their home. They were just a passing through. Their treasures were laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckoned them from heaven's open door, and they just never felt quite at home in this world anymore. Hallelujah. You ever get to feeling like that? I, I'm not saying you're hankering to go today, but I tell you what, you ever get to feeling like this where, hallelujah, you realize that there's something better waiting on you. So you might just one of these days say, Lord, come quickly. Lord, come quickly. Verse 22, by faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. Now, that's strong faith right there. That's strong belief that, hey, y'all, everyone are getting out of this bondage place. Think about how Joseph lived the lion's share of his life in Egypt. But he never really felt at home there. So he said to his descendants, you're not going to be here forever, so when you leave, don't leave my bones 
behind in this old place. Take my bones with you. Verse 23, by faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. Hallelujah, boy babies were dying right and left, but Moses' mama hid him by the riverside. Hallelujah, by faith, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Through faith he kept the Passover. And the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians, assaying to do, were drowned. You said, but how in the world, Brother Sartre, could all of this happen? It happened first because God was and is still sovereign. He can do anything he chooses at any time he chooses to do it. And God's plan was this. Yes, Moses, you're going to be raised in the palaces of Pharaoh. But while you're being raised in this God-forsaken place, through supernatural means, you'll be raised by your own mama. And your mama's never going to let you forget that you are not an Egyptian. Well, amen, glory to God, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want you to know your children can be saved. They should be saved. If you never let them forget, you are not an Egyptian. Honey, you are not an Egyptian. Verse 30, by faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. By faith the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. Verse 32, and what Shall I more say, for the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah, of David also and Samuel and all of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. This had to be speaking about Daniel being cast into the lion's den and how God gave those lions lockjaw and a shot of lazy medicine so they wouldn't get their claws out and put them on the man of God. Verse 34, then spoke of those who quenched the violence of fire. Who do you think that was talking about? This had to be talking about the three Hebrew children were cast while bound into the burning fiery furnace, but the flames could not burn them. Then it said there were those who escaped the edge of the sword. Could this have been speaking about Paul when he escaped by way of a basket let down from a window? When they would have taken him out? Then it spoke about one who out of weakness was made strong, waxed valiant, and fight. Think here again about Samson. He turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Friends, I'm telling you what, there's a lot of faith found in this one chapter. Verse 35, women received their dead back to life again. Lazarus, come forth. And he came forth bound. Hallelujah, head to toe. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. In other words, their minds wasn't on the here and the now. Their minds were on what was coming their way. Others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. Oh, yeah. They were sawn asunder were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. From the expositor, we find the faith that equips people to be strong in victory also equips them to be hopeful in suffering. 
Even with the record of victories presented here, the writer shows that suffering is part of God's purposes. When faced with the alternative between death and renouncing their faith, these champions, just like the Old Testament prophets, refused, they refused, they refused to be broken. They accepted the world's worst to gain God's best. I like the way he said that. They would not sacrifice their future on the altar of the immediate. In other words, I'm not giving up what's coming to have a little calm in my life right now. No way, no how. Verse 38, then said of these of whom the world was not worthy, they wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth, and these all, having obtained a good report through faith, Receive not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. I got to reading these 40 verses over the last few days, and I was amazed at how many times the words by faith, through faith, in faith, without faith, and that, that's not talking about not having faith. That's all. Without faith, it is impossible to please him without faith. And then there's must believe. He is a rewarder. She judged God faithful over and over and over and over in 40 verses. It was just one after another by faith. It was all about believing and trusting and knowing that God was in charge and knowing that it was going to be okay when it was all said and done. Let me say this as gently as possible. Many Christians today spend so much time focusing on the things that aren't right in their lives that they many times forget that God can make things that aren't right, right. God can make things that aren't right, right. One more time. God can make things that aren't right, right. You say, what do I need for God to do that? Faith, belief, trust, knowing that God's got me, knowing that he'll never leave nor forsake me knowing that he's got his hands on my life, knowing that he hasn't forgot me. Hallelujah. You say, well, I'm going through problems. Man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. But hallelujah, don't, don't, don't focus all of your energy on that. Focus on God that can do exceeding abundantly above all we could ask or think according to the power that worketh within us. Some years back, I met a preacher, pastors in Colorado on a missions trip. And uh, this man had endured a couple of mighty bad cancer struggles. Doctors, when it was all said and done, had to end up reconstructing his jaw from the chemo and radiation treatments that he had to take. You say, well, why didn't God heal him? I don't have a clue. I don't know. Sometimes God says, I want to see whether you can get through this thing. I want to see if you're going to hold fast and be true and go through this thing in spite of all of these things. Remember that scripture just a minute ago? They were sawn asunder. They, they wandered around in sheepskins and they stayed in caves and all that. Remember that scripture? Sometimes God, it's what I taught about in one of my devotions this week. Sometimes it's not about arriving, it's not about starting, it's about the journey. Sometimes it's about how we arrive and all that we go through during the journey. Those are really the times that we learn so much that we don't learn just by, you know, gaining the ring at the end of the race. Does that make any sense? So anyway, I bet this man and he was, I mean, he he had gone through some some things and I was on Facebook the other day and I happened across 
one of his posts from years ago that I'd like to read to you now. This man's, man's name is Dieter Scourin, and this is the way he, he wrote this post. He said, a few years ago, I wrote an article in the morning time as I was meditating on the powerful changes the Word of God, together with real faith, can make in our lives. I wanted to share it today. He writes, true faith affects our very thinking. How we process all information and how we make every choice in our lives. And those lifestyle changes are completely based on whether or not we are submitted to God. What I'm saying is Bible readers and folks that daily spend time in heartfelt prayer can get to the point where Jesus can't be extracted from any equation or situation. So let's heed the warning in Matthew 15, 8 through 9, where Jesus said, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. He continues with, Until we meet Jesus on the other side of this life, we will never lose our faults nor humanity. I know this firsthand. So don't feel overwhelmed by that. But make sure to avoid giving God just an honorable mention or lip service. Let's really put his word in our hearts today and seek him in prayer. Thank God the Bible promises it will affect everything you and I think, say, and do. I want to pull out one statement this man had concerning faith. He again writes in this passage here, true faith affects our very thinking, how we process all information, and how we make every choice and those lifestyle changes are completely based on whether or not we're submitted to God. Friends, that's profound. So here's the question. Are we submitted to God? If we are, then our faith is active in every aspect of our lives. If things are good, our faith is active. If things are bad, our faith is active. When all is well, our faith is active. And when all is unwell, our faith is still active. Paul, above all, understood going through bad and good things in faith. He said in Philippians 4.11, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. My God, in a Mamertine prison for all those years, and I have learned in whatsoever state I find myself therewith to be content. He said, I know how to be abased and I know how to abound everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full but also to be empty or to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. I wish somebody would say that with me. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. One more time, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Come on, I mean, I'm telling you, you need to say it with belief. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. I mean, how in the world was Paul able to say these things after he had gone through all of the junk that he had gone through? Again, Dieter Scour, in true faith, affects our very thinking, how we process all information, and how we make every choice. And those lifestyle changes are completely based on whether or not we're submitted to God. Are we getting this? Here's the question. How in the world do I get hold of true and living faith? 
Oh, forgive me. Forgive me. I was at a funeral one time and somebody had their watch on and it went off at a funeral. That's a bad time to have that happen to you. So how do I get a hold of true faith? Romans chapter 10 verse 17 said it like this. So faith, so then faith, faith in what? In the promises of God as well as faith in the God of the promises cometh by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. Word here comes from the Greek word rhema and means when God breaks silence on a matter, it speaks to the speaking word of God. The point being, if you want the kind of faith that moves mountains, that casts down imaginations and any high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, you must regularly pray in the Holy Ghost. I'm talking about praying in the Spirit, praying in tongues. You say, well, Brother Sarton, I've always heard that not everybody has the gift of tongues. Everybody that receives the baptism of the Holy Ghost speaks in tongues. And you've got the ability to enter into that prayer place and pray in tongues. It takes faith to step into that spiritual arena, but when you step into that spiritual arena, your faith begins to grow. It begins to build up. When you begin to pray in the Holy Ghost, I'm telling you, you can feel your spirit man beginning to grow, beginning to mature, beginning to step out. Well, amen, glory to God, hallelujah. We got to pray in the Spirit faithfully. Because if we are, we're hearing God break silence on matters of importance, and we're hearing that regularly. Every time you go to prayer, church, you need to hear me now, pray with purpose. Pray with this goal. At some point, I'm going to move into that secret place, and I'm going to pray in the Holy Ghost. One said, but I don't know what I'm praying about while praying in the Holy Ghost. What am I praying about? I don't have a clue. And yet while you're spending time in the Spirit, your faith is again building. It's growing. And if your faith is growing, then there is little God will not move upon or within your life for you. So get in the Holy Ghost. And you don't have to wait till the Lord's Day on Sunday. You can do it every single day of your life. Just spend some time. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Paul said, I will pray with the understanding. I will pray in the Spirit. In other words, he did it both ways. I do it too that way. I pray in the, in the, in the, I pray with my common tongue and I pray in the Holy Ghost. And when I pray in the Spirit, my spirit man begins to grow. It takes faith to pray in the Holy Ghost. You've got to exercise your faith to pray in the Holy Ghost. So that grows your faith. Make sense? Truth of the matter is far too many simply go through the motions when they pray. They say the words but never get locked in with God. Never commune with God. Never move into that spiritual place. They never go where their spirit is connected with God's spirit and relationship occurs. And friends, that's where a whole lot of religion lives today. Disconnected from God. They've got the dogma They've got the book. I've got a lot of time. They've got the Old Testament, but they don't have anything in the New Testament. Friends, we got we got we got to get the whole book. We got to get the whole book. Again, far too many are just going through the motions. Hallelujah, Hallelujah. So we've got to be connected. You know, we can make this about religion or we can make this about relationship. You've got to have a certain part of it is religion. You come to church on Sunday morning, you come to church on Sunday night, you come to church on Wednesday night. That's the religion part of it. But while we're in church, we can have relationship. While we're in the prayer room before church, we can have relationship. Hallelujah. While we're driving our car heading home, we can have relationship. 
Aleluya, 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 aleluya. James 2.17. Hallelujah. Go ahead. Clap your hands. Hallelujah to the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, certain I have not developed in my prayer just like that just yet. We, we work on it. We work on it. Once you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you have the ability to pray in the Spirit. I don't know why I'm getting hung up here, but I'm hung up here. Once you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you are introduced into another realm. You're introduced, you're, you, step, you step into the realm of God. And so God says you're not, you're not just on your own. You're not just this flesh and blood being out here. But no, you're, you've got a spiritual part to you and you can connect with me. And we can have religion. And I mean, we can have religion, but we've got to have relationship. So, hallelujah, that's so important. It's so important. It's so important. Hallelujah. James 2.17, even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. So the devils are believers out there. In other words, they're believers that there's a God out there. So if it was all about faith, no, you've got to have some works with your faith. Well, amen, glory to God, hallelujah. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called the what? The friend of God. Let me be called the friend of God. I don't want to be called the foe of God. I want to be called the friend of God. Verse 24, you see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers, the spies, and had sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. You know, you can have all the faith in the world, but you've got to put some works. Noah could have all the faith in the world, but he still had to get out there and build that ship. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. It's certain you don't understand. I prayed nothing. God just doesn't hear me. He doesn't care. He's unconcerned with my plights. If this is how you're thinking, you need an attitude adjustment. Perhaps the one you're praying for is resisting the higher power. God's not going to force. He's a gentleman. God's not going to force himself on anybody. Perhaps they're stubborn and rebellion is all get out and they have to do some humbling before God will move and do a lasting work. How about this? Sometimes we're praying and our motivation is wrong. Perhaps lust of the eye is driving us and here God will say no every single time. If it's about Fulfilling flesh, he's going to say, wait a minute, wait a minute, guy. This isn't about, this, this isn't about that. You've got to make sure your motive is right. And there are times when we're praying for things that God just will not give us. I'm not speaking about salvation issues here. I'm speaking about us asking for things that are just not in God's, not wheelhouse, but wheelhouse. For instance, sometimes we're praying for things that God knows if we get them, will destroy us. Well, you say, well, I prayed for this thing and I prayed for this thing and nothing. Well, God loves you enough to save you from your own ignorance. You're asking for something that's going to wipe you out, destroy you. Destroy your lineage, destroy everything in your life. Oh, I'm asking you, God, and I'm believing you, God. And God's saying, wait a minute, big boy. I'm sovereign, and you're not. I'm God, and you're not. So you need to trust me here. 
I know what I'm doing. I know what's good for you, and I know what's not good for you. I know when you've got to go through things, and I know when you don't. And then there's the timing issues, where the thing we're asking for, it's going to be okay, only not right now. Here we have to keep on praying, and when the time's right, God will do it. It's not, not like God's reject, rejecting us. He said it's, not, it's just not time yet. And so there's a lot more tied into this than just having faith and having the works necessary to receive. It's also about God having a say in the matter. And so we've got to accept that. God, you've got a say in the matter. In closing, I want to go back and read again from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 where we find, but without faith, without belief, without trust, without knowing beyond the shadow of a doubt that God is able, and also knowing and believing that God is willing, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him question is this, do you believe God will reward your efforts as you diligently seek him? If you do, if you believe like that, he most times will. Unless he sees that giving it to you will destroy you. I'm going back through over old material, but unless he sees that if I give you this, it's going to destroy you. He's not going to do that. You can forget it. And he's not going to do it if, if, if he gives it to you. In other words, he's not going to give it to you if he sees that if this is all about my luster working overtime. It's what I want. doesn't matter what's right. Okay? So, without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So again, do we believe that God will reward us? Here's another scripture for you. Hebrews 10, 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus Christ. For us today, that's speaking about that secret place, that place of worship. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful, that promise. And no, that scripture does not preach that we sprinkle baptism converts. No, it doesn't. We are buried with him in baptism. We're buried with him in baptism. We go under the water. Well, amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I don't know where that came from. This is what spirit prayer is all about. Getting in the spirit, holding fast to the profession of our faith, and knowing beyond the shadow of a doubt that God is faithful. And so I'm preaching tonight about the doctrine of faith. And I'm preaching that it is vital. Because again, without faith, it is impossible to please him. And so as we wrap this up tonight, I have some questions. Let me see if any of this took. You know, sometimes I... You go to the doctor and they give you a prescription or they give you this and you know sometimes maybe they wonder you know after you a couple of days did it take did it take what I gave you did it fix you you know and so I have some questions I want to see if this took tonight all right so somebody tell me what is faith what is faith
the things not seen. That's true. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Well, let's explain that a bit. So, can anybody explain that out a little bit more? Brother Ryan. Yeah. You just believe that God's working in this thing. Does anybody believe that faith is absolute conviction based on the assurance of God's unchangeable and perfect character that his promises will be fulfilled? I know that's a long way of saying what she said. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. What are some of the things that hinder God moving for us? What are some of the things that hinder God moving for us? What? Lack of faith? Yeah. Brother Brother Lewis? Huh? Lack of belief. That's right. That's right. What? That it'll hurt us? Oh, that's right. That's right. Sometimes God's not going to do it because it, it has the potential to harm us. Somebody else. That's right. Not time yet. That's it. That's it. How about this one? How about this one? Here's one that hadn't been named yet. When he speaks to us to do, we've got to move. If we don't move when he tells us to move, then that hinders. If Noah had gotten busy doing other things instead of building on the ark, it wouldn't have got done in time for the rains to come. Guess what? How about Abraham? Do you think he would have been considered a strong man of faith if God told him to get away from those idolaters and just get to looking for a city whose builder and maker is? Do you think God would have still honored him if he had just stayed home? No, he had to, he had to move. He had to get busy. He had to do it, start doing something, right? How about this one? Wavering from faith to doubt. Faith to doubt. What does the scripture say? Let, 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 let this man not think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Is that what that says? Nothing wavering, or let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Huh? Double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. That sound good? That's right. How about this one? How about this one? The question again is, what are some of the things that hinder God's moving for us? How about negative voices that are seeding anti-faith thoughts into our lives? Oh, this will never happen. Oh, just, just suck it up, buttercup. Just learn to live with this. How about this question? Why are there times when God just will not move for us? We know this by heart. Come on. Sometimes God says no. Sometimes God says wait a while. How about this one? God will not move if he sees that a thing is going to be bad for us. We just talked about that. Right? He will not send what we would perceive to be a blessing when he knows it will become a curse. This is why praying in the Spirit is so important because God will confirm what's acceptable. He will deny what is unsuccessful, unacceptable. Here's what our daily prayer needs to be. Let's all stand. Here it is. Every day of our lives, we need to pray this prayer. Lord, increase my faith. One more time. Lord, increase my faith. Now you asked him, you believe it's going to happen? You believe he's going to Well, see, some of this happened already tonight. Hallelujah. I bet you your faith is riding a little higher right now, right? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your holy word tonight. Thank you, Lord, for all of these people that came to church tonight. Thank you, Lord, for all of those people, God, that that plugged into the website, Lord, and are watching, Lord, this service tonight. I am asking you to do incredible things this weekend in your people's lives, God. I'm asking you to go with us, Lord. If we go into the fire, let it, let it not kindle against us, Lord. If we go into the flood, Lord, 
Hallelujah. Let us rise above the flood, Lord. I'm praying for your people today. Do incredible things in the lives of your people. Increase our faith, O oh God. Increase our faith, O oh God. In Jesus' name, amen.